Hello everyone, welcome to Business School 101. With the second largest nominal GDP, China is one of the fastest growing and most influential economies in the world. In addition, 143 Chinese companies made it to the global Fortune 500 list in 2021, surpassing runner-up United States for the second consecutive year. So what is China's general business environment? Can we apply Hofstede cultural framework to analyze China's business culture? Do Chinese companies obtain some unique organizational cultures or business etiquettes? In this video, I will discuss these topics with you. Section 1. General Business Environment China, officially the People's Republic of China, is a country in East Asia. It is the world's most populous country with a population of more than 1.4 billion. Covering an area of approximately 9.6 million square kilometers, it is the world's third largest country. The national capital is Beijing, and the largest city is Shanghai. Standard Mandarin, a variety of Mandarin based on the Beijing dialect, is the official national language of China. Confucianism is a dominated Chinese belief system, which focuses on the importance of personal ethics and morality. Since 2010, China has become the second largest economy in the world. According to the data from the World Bank, China's GDP in 2019 was 14.28 trillion US dollars. Many economists across the world predict that, if China keep its growth rate, it could surpass the US to become the largest economy within the next decade. However, please keep in mind that although China's overall GDP is magnificent, because of China's huge population, its GDP per capita is around $10,200 in 2019, which is about one-sixth of America's GDP per capita. In addition, many researchers suggest that over the past few years, China's economic growth has gradually moderated in the face of structural constraints, including increasing labor cost, declining labor force growth, diminishing returns to investment, and slowing productivity. On the Corruption Perception Index, 2021, China ranks 66th out of 180 countries, receiving a score of 45. The scale ranges from zero, highly corrupt, to 100, very clean. For example, Denmark, Finland, and New Zealand equally rank number one with a score of 88. South Sudan ranks 180 with a score of 11. Section 2. China's Hofstede Scores. As we covered in previous video, Hofstede Cultural Framework is one of the most widely used tools to analyze a country's culture. Therefore, let's check China's scores in Hofstede's six-dimension cultural framework. Please keep in mind Hofstede's score on each dimension is on a scale from 0 to 100. Dimension 1. Power Distance. Power distance refers to how openly a society or culture either accepts or rejects differences between people, for instance, hierarchies in the workplace, in politics, and so on. At 80, China sits in the higher rankings of power distance index. In China, most people believe that inequalities amongst people are acceptable. The subordinate-superior relationship tends to be polarized, and there is no defense against power abuse by superiors. Individuals are influenced by formal authority and sanctions. In addition, people believe they should not have aspirations beyond their rank. Dimension 2. Individualism. The individualism versus collectivism dimension considers the degree to which societies are integrated into groups as well as their perceived obligations and dependence on groups. It can also refer to people's tendency to take care of themselves and their immediate circle of family and friends, perhaps at the expense of the overall society. At a score of 20, China is a highly collectivist culture, where people act in the interests of the group and not necessarily of themselves. In-group considerations affect hiring and promotions with closer in-groups are getting preferential treatment. Employee commitment to the organization is low, whereas relationships with colleagues are cooperative for in-groups, they are cold or even hostile to out-groups. Personal relationships prevail over task and company. Dimension 3. Masculinity. The masculinity versus femininity dimension is also referred to as tough versus tender, and it considers the preference of society for achievement, behavior, attitude towards gender equality, and more. At 66, China is a masculine society which features with success-oriented and driven. The need to ensure success can be exemplified by the fact that many Chinese will sacrifice family and leisure priorities to work. Service industries, such as barbershops and restaurants, will provide services until very late at night. Leisure time is not so important. Chinese migrated farmer workers will leave their families behind in faraway places in order to obtain better work and pay in the cities. 
Another example is that Chinese students care very much about their exam scores and ranking as this is the major criteria to achieve success or not. Dimension 4, Uncertainty Avoidance. The Uncertainty Avoidance Dimension considers the extent to which uncertainty and ambiguity are tolerated. This dimension also considers how unknown situations and unexpected events are dealt with. At 30, China has a low score on uncertainty avoidance. Adherence to laws and rules may be flexible to suit the actual situation, and pragmatism is a fact of life. The Chinese are comfortable with ambiguity, the Chinese language is full of ambiguous meanings that can be difficult for Western people to follow. Chinese are adaptable and entrepreneurial. The majority of Chinese businesses tend to be small to medium-sized and family-owned. Dimension 5, Long-Term Orientation. The Long-Term Orientation versus Short-Term Orientation Dimension considers the extent to which society views its time horizon. Long-Term Orientation emphasizes perseverance and growth. In contrast, Short-Term Orientation focuses on the near future by delivering short-term success and emphasizing the present. At 87, China is a very long-term orientated society. This ties in with Chinese people's drive to succeed in life, they are willing to persevere and work for a long time to achieve. Chinese people are not so much about instant gratification, and when they invest in things, it tends to be for the long term. Conveying the permanence and durability of your product or services is therefore going to be more appealing than short-term pleasure. Dimension 6, Indulgence. Indulgence indicates that a society allows relatively free gratification related to having fun in life. Conversely, restraint indicates that a society suppresses gratification of needs and regulates it through social norms. At 24, Chinese has a low score on indulgence. Countries that have a lot of restraints normally have a lot of social norms to regulate behavior. In particular, they will be good at controlling immediate gratification, and instead will be able to delay rewards and stay focused on task until a project is completed. These factors have been previously well ingrained into the Chinese culture. Section 3, Organizational Cultures. Generally, the Chinese organizational cultures have three important features, hierarchy, guangxi, and political tie. Let's discuss is them individually. First, hierarchy. The hierarchical approach is underpinned by the influence of thousands of years of Confucian teaching and a strongly hierarchical bureaucratic party structure. The combination of these two influences means that local hierarchies need to be understood and interacted with appropriately. Information does not flow freely around a strong hierarchy, but follows the hierarchical lines. Thus a subordinate will give information to their boss who will then pass it horizontally to a counterpart in a different function before it is pushed down the chain again to the relevant party. When the information is sent back, it follows the same path in reverse. This means that information flow around a local organization can be slow. It also puts an emphasis on getting the information to the right person first time, otherwise even more valuable time could be lost. In addition, managers are expected to manage in China, and management style therefore tends towards the paternalistic, which means subordinates are expected to follow orders unquestioningly, even if they suspect the boss is wrong. Second, Guangxi. Guangxi is a Chinese term meaning relationships, in business, it commonly refers to the networks or connections used to open doors for new business and facilitate deals. The term refers not just to the existence of relationships but to their nature, to having personal trust and a strong relationship. It can also create moral obligations and require the exchanging of favors. A person who has a great deal of Guangxi will be better positioned to generate business than someone who lacks it. Building Guangxi is usually a long-term process. Several techniques can help do so. You can begin by gaining knowledge about China's history and culture. Seeking formal introductions to individuals with whom you want to do business is also helpful to start relationships, especially where you make a conscious effort to create trust and social contact. Finally, gifts and entertaining, especially dinners, are common approaches of building social capital in China. Third, political tie. Political ties are a firm's informal social connections with government officials in various levels of administration, including central and local governments, and officials in regulation agencies, such as tax or stock market administrative bureaus. Political ties help firms obtain key regulatory resources. First, governments in China guide economic activities by devising industry development plans and setting regulatory policies. Political connections provide firms with crucial access to policy and aggregate industrial information. 
Second, the Chinese government still controls a significant portion of scarce resources, such as land, bank loans, subsidies, and tax breaks, and affirms connections with government officials offer shortcuts to these resources. Third, political ties improve a firm's political legitimacy, or the extent to which government officials or agencies assume that the focal firm's actions are desirable and proper. For example, Chinese firms with government connections can gain political legitimacy by obtaining positions in parliament. Political legitimacy then helps firms receive exclusive government endorsements and favorable treatment. Section 4. Business Etiquettes. Here are some important business etiquettes you need to be aware when you meet or negotiate with your Chinese partners. 1. Workplaces in China are definitively hierarchical based on age and position, and everyone has a distinct place and role within their company. 2. During business meetings, traditionally, the host will give a quick speech greeting everyone before discussing the topic of business. Chinese colleagues may applaud when you are introduced as a way of greeting you and showing approval. If so, it is appropriate to applaud back. 3. Allow a few moments of social conversation to pass before mentioning business. Popular casual topics include comments of the local weather, food, points of interests, and economic development. Take some time to do some preparation on these subjects, as it can be very helpful in building a positive relationship and gaining one's acceptance. 4. Although most Chinese are tolerant people, avoid discussing political beliefs, especially with people you meet for the first time. It is better to stay away from topics related to democracy, freedom of speech, Taiwan, Xinjiang, and Tibet. 5. Be sure to introduce the history, status, size, reputation and wealth of your company. If you do not, expect to be asked many questions until you've covered all of this information. 6. The Chinese often nod while a person speaks. This does not necessarily indicate agreement, but rather suggests that the listener understands what the speaker is saying. 7. For the sake of saving face, the Chinese will seldom give a flat negative response to proposals made, even when they do not agree with it. Therefore, focus on hints of hesitation. Listen closely to what they say, but also pay careful attention to what they don't say and double-check your understanding. 8. Similarly, do not immediately reject a proposal from a Chinese person or company. When you reject someone's idea, there is a risk of this being interpreted as you rejecting the person lead into criticism gradually, rather than doing so bluntly. 9. Either use both hands or the right hand alone when giving a business card and ensure that the writing is facing the other person. Do not deal out your cards as if you were playing a game of cards as this risks being interpreted as rude. 10. It is considered rude to interrupt, so refrain from doing so. Furthermore, if the natural conversation dynamic between you and your colleagues is to talk over one another, a Chinese person will not interrupt you to make their point heard. Therefore, try to slow down and pause between your points to give them an opportunity to speak. 11. To avoid confusion with your Chinese business counterpart regarding dates, write out the month in letters. If you do write a date in numbers, list the year first, followed by the month then the day. For example, 2017, September, 30th. 12. The number 8 is considered the luckiest number, while the number 4 is considered unlucky. All right, that's all for today's topic. So, how do you think about Chinese business culture? Do you have any related experience or story willing to share? Please leave your thoughts in a comment below. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.